Recently, Jonathan Kahn released a book called The Return of the Gods, and I was very intrigued by the thesis that he put forward. The gods of the ancient world were exorcised from the civilized world and had been cast out of places of power. However, with the emergence of atheistic materialist ideologies, these gods have begun to crop back up to center stage. The book details the traits of these ancient gods emerging in culture today, from rebelliousness and wealth to androgynous sexuality and a culture of waste and death. Baal is an honorific title meaning lord or master in northwestern Semitic languages. It has been used to refer to various deities in different ancient cultures, and as such, there isn't a single uniform representation of Baal across all pantheons. In the Canaanite religion, Baal is often associated with storms, thunder, and fertility. He is considered a god of rain and agricultural abundance, playing a crucial role in ensuring fertility in the land. Inanna is a prominent goddess in Sumerian and Babylonian mythology, known as the Queen of Heaven and the goddess of love and war. She is associated with the planet Venus and is often depicted as a multifaceted deity, embodying both love and warfare, male and female. Inanna's descent to the underworld and subsequent resurrection is a well-known myth, symbolizing the cycle of death and rebirth. Moloch is often depicted as a god associated with fire, and in particular, child sacrifice. There are references in biblical texts condemning the worship of Moloch, suggesting that devotees offer their children as burnt sacrifices and rituals. The worship of Moloch is notably connected to the Carthaginian culture, an ancient Phoenician city-state. Historical accounts suggest that Carthaginians engaged in child sacrifice as part of their religious practices. In Carthage, Moloch is sometimes identified with Baal Hamon, a god associated with the sun and fertility. Baal Hamon was often depicted with upraised arms, and some historical accounts link this posture to the ritualistic gestures involved in the worship of Moloch. I like how this image generated of these three deities in relation to Jonathan Kahn's book. Jonathan Kahn associates Baal with wealth, independence, power. Imagine the age of the rise of the lodge and um, industrialism, revolutions and democracy in the West. I find this picture compelling because note there's something like a fruit sphere hovering above the hand of the deity Baal on the far left. Jonathan Kahn associates Baal with elevation, wealth, independence. And if you think about something that's been attained but not consumed, you get the idea of fruit that's near the hand but not in hand, right? It's something that you have access to, but you don't have it. So I think that's a neat way this generated. And then if you look to the middle deity, which is Astarte or Anana, you'll see that she has fruit in hand. And she is called by Jonathan Kahn the Enchantress or the or the tavern prostitute. In other words, she is identified initially with love, passion, and you might say the flesh, right? Consumption in the flesh, indulgence. You can see an apple in hand as a symbol of indulgence. But then if you look to the right, Moloch, who is associated with fire, his hands, the work of his hands is fire. And then as we descend to the area of reproduction, you see a beast's head, and what looks like decay in tattered rags. In other words, this is the destruction of children, the stopping of the reproductive function. And I think this is a really neat image in that sense that we can see that. The fruit not attained for Baal, he's got it at his fingertips, but he's not using it. Astarte Anana has got fruit in hand, or in other words, indulgence. And then finally, slavery to the, the, that fruit and lack of fecundity, trading your children for the goods of the earth with Moloch. Jonathan Kahn is somewhat ambiguous concerning whether he is presenting the return of these deities in a literal versus a spiritual, existential sense of the deities. In the interviews that he has given since the release of the book, it seems that he is siding with the literal. He's presenting these as actual beings that will show up or are showing up and then at some point may pop their heads out and stand on a stage. Uh, in a similar sense to the way most non-Catholic Christians and many 
many Catholic Christians see the idea of the Antichrist, i.e. a man similar to a superhero that will show up in the future and take over the government. In terms of the Catholic faith, believing in the return of the gods in the same manner as most think of the coming of the Antichrist would likely be considered heretical. However, the idea of the spiritual increase in prominence of what these deities represent in his book, I think his conclusions are incontrovertible. While he simplifies the identity and function of these deities and fits them to all pantheons, presumably on the earth, in terms of statistics, this would be like applying smoothing to the deities. So he's kind of pigeonholing or fitting them into the boxes of these three deities when there's a lot more nuance. While he's doing that, and that's obviously not exactly accurate, I think his broad generalizations are largely correct. I think you can see this, the idea that you'd have a powerful warlord who gives you wealth and the rain for your crops because he's strong and he can just do that as a primary deity makes perfect sense. And you do see those deities, Zeus, etc., all throughout all the pantheons across the earth. And the idea that then there would be this beautiful kind of wild combat warrior woman who's also a femme fatale and also a mother that would kind of take this secondary role and it seems to be present in all these pantheons also makes perfect sense. Um, and then finally, the idea that, that that in hard times when you really need something really bad and the idea that you can really give up a lot and get a big return, the idea of big, big payouts for big return, that God, the idea that you'd have one of those makes perfect sense too. So, so as a general spiritual take on his book, I think it's spot on. It's a really interesting book in that sense. I think most people reading it are thinking of it more in, a, in kind of an antichrist figures that are going to pop up on the stage eventually type of way. But if you think of it in terms of these these um, these ruling spiritual powers over the over the over the self and over the community, I think his book is is a great book, and he is identifying the effects of the reduction in Christianity on the previously Christian populations and the reemergence of things like gender bending, gender fluidity, uh, the devaluation of human life, exemplified in Moloch worship, and he parallels that with rejection of children in, in, in terminations as well as in just a lack of desire for children in the modern world in the West. But to go one step further, I really think that things that are spiritual are real. In a, in a real sense. And that doesn't mean that they have bodies and they, and they uh, will walk up on a stage, but they're as real as you and I. So these spiritual realities, the idea of the ruling God that always emerges in all of the pantheons for thousands and thousands of years, identified in these three entities in Jonathan Kahn's book, these are real spiritual beings in a, in a real sense like we think of angels, etc., and I think if you look at something like comic books, TV shows, movies, and video games, you're going to see these same motifs emerging in the consciousness of the particular experiencer. So you're going to have a different set slightly of what these deities, you might call them deities, are for men and women, but boys and girls oftentimes. But the idea, I think in a sense, if you look at the ancient pantheons, they're going to mirror what you might see in a teenage boy's mind. You're going to have strong, tough, powerful men um, as the primary deity, and then you're going to have hot, beautiful, you know, voluptuous and and uh, and wild, sorceress, powerful sword fighter woman who's kind of manly too. Makes perfect sense. I mean, you see 100 characters like that in video games. Is that a Nana? I think in a sense it is. I think in a sense, these are the reemergence of these deities. And I think that in a really realistic way, Christianity did lock us out from these kind of motifs and these kind of uh, presentations. But with the looseness that, that has emerged with the dominant atheistic culture or dominant, I'd say, agnostic or godless culture, we have seen a reemergence of the gods, but we just don't know it. And I think in that sense, Jonathan Kahn is exactly right. And I think it has the effect that he's presenting. The idea that you start by, take, by, by focusing people on wealth, power, and money, and not on the family, not on progeny, not on the future. And then from there, you turn them to pleasures and enjoyment, and you start having things like questions and sexuality, 
and identification and gender bending and as that as you go down that road and you continue down that road you you lose the stability of the family and then you start seeing the result in lack of fecundity you see the destruction of families you see the end of family lines you see the inability to hold together and the falling apart of society so you see a, a de degradation in civilization that's going to emerge from that and so i think he's right in his estimation here in a large way, and I think it's something to look at. I think it's something to pay attention to, and I think we see it in our popular culture right now, and I think his identification um, of these themes, these ideas, these new practices, these new identities and new religions is spot, spot on. The music at the beginning of this video is taken from Requiem for a Dream, and while I wouldn't recommend the film because it's problematic in a lot of ways, it does represent the sin and its effects in a really beautiful way where it shows how it takes a person apart and it shows the selfishness and the disgustingness of of really this process. If you think about in an individual person's life, you'll see the motif of these gods. You'll see the, you know, kind of the excitement of receiving your, you know, freedom, your ability, your your power, your strength, your autonomy, and then you jump in in sin that's what you do in sin you jump in and you do this in your life in a lot of different ways and as you grab hold and you think you can take it to yourself and you can be competitive and you can overcome everybody else around you what ends up happening is you fall headlong into it and you go way too far it takes you way too far and then you find yourself on the ground in suffering in at least a small death you may survive it in your life you may survive it spiritually but um, it's a really a terrible thing that happens over and over again. And I'd say it happens over and over again with each sin um, in our own life as well. Each sin. And uh, you get this, these pictures of your eyes widen up in excitement and elation when you think you have this option. And then all of a sudden it, they narrow in, in enjoyment as you think you're, you're grabbing onto this fruit and you're partaking in it and you're getting it. And then finally the horror sets in of what you've done in your enjoyment. And this happens over and over again, over and over again, 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 again. And so I just want to connect that to the general theme of Jonathan Kahn's book, the idea of Baal being that elation, that that over ex, overconfident excitement, and then Inanna or or Astarta representing jumping headlong into it, uh, representing this deceptive woman who pulls you in and you go too far. And all of a sudden, you don't even know yourself anymore. And the only way to get your fix is to trade with Moloch. You know, if you, you start to value, then you need that that payout of the flesh, whatever kind of sin it is. And you start to pay and you'll trade your children to get your fix. And this theme is played over and over again in our lives. And it's a horror that you can see, especially when people lose God. You see that these three gods take hold of that person's life and you can just watch them, whip them back and forth as they serve and fail and serve their flesh and they fail and they serve their flesh and they fail. And this cycle is the life, sadly, of us if we don't anchor ourselves in the righteousness of God's law and service to God himself. We can try to trade um, service to him for just those practices of righteousness, but there's a little bit more elevated game of failure that you fall into there and the same kind of thing, that same foolishness in the in the um, lawful atheist or the lawful godless person's life, they also fall. Just they can't. It's, it's always right beyond the ability for you to perceive it. But other people can see it. Some other people can see it. And it will play out in your life in the end. You'll see it. So here's the dream of the great demolition. I'm driving in a car with a couple of other people in a big city um, in right in the downtown area. They've cordoned off a huge section of the city. I don't know exactly how much, but just imagine it's the whole thing. Basically, the whole city is cordoned off for demolition. And there's different stages of demolition taking place about all the houses inside of this uh, surrounding. It's that, that orange you know, construction fencing inside of it are at different stages of destruction. They've got, they've either, you know, been structurally, un, you know, kind of hobbled so they're unsound or they're starting to be worked on or they're literally a pile of rubble on the ground. And I found out that I can drive my car into this construction zone and I can get in there. So I drive in with these couple of people in the car with me 
and I park. And then we th- I think to myself, well, maybe in this house over here that's about to be dropped on the ground, there's some good stuff in there. So maybe we should go check before they drop it to the ground. So then the scene changes. And I'm, there's somebody, I'm, I'm on a bird's eye view, there's somebody on the roof of a house, and they're standing there. It's more like a building. It's got a flat top. And there's somebody coming over the side of the building as well, and they have an automatic weapon in their hand. And they run downstairs. Um, the person who, who is standing on, who's in the house, but not the person with the gun, runs downstairs, and the person with the gun chases them. And when they get to the bottom floor, they get to the front door, and this is now a childhood house that I lived in or a house I lived in about 10 or 15 years ago, so a little older than childhood. But the person comes to the bottom of the stairs and aims the gun, and, and the, the person who's going to run lays on the ground thinking they're about to get shot. There's a question that's asked back, back and forth, why why didn't you shoot upstairs? And the person who's got the gun said the gun jammed. So a basic organic interpretation, the houses are households, they're families, they're organic units of people. So this is collections of people, ideas, or um, like literally families that are trying to hold together in society, but they're actually cordoned off and planned for destruction by an authority. So people are kind of generally being destroyed, right? Families are being destroyed. And nobody can come in. And what is a person in this case? I would assume it's a spirit or some kind of help. You know, no, no spirit, no angel can come in. Let's say no message can get to the person. Nobody can come in and stay in the house and help that family um, either to get out of there and find a way to survive separately or to uh, or to salvage the household. Nobody can do that because when when a spirit comes in to enter, there's somebody who climbs the roof with a gun. In other words, there there's it's it's it's, it's occupied territory. You get the idea that we, we live in occupied territory. And it's kind of interesting because when you think about it, we do. It seems like you have to be cautious about everything, you know. So, for example, we can quote from the scripture. Christ said, we have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. You know, we got to be shrewd while at the same time peaceful and and uh, gentle, you know. But we really need to be shrewd. We need to be careful. We need to realize that you can't, you can't really rest and say, I've got this. The idea that, for example, someone's going to have God speaking to them every day for 20, 30 years of their life, and there's no problem in there. I think we need to have a bit of reservation there and think there's a lot of voices coming in. And maybe uh, we're in occupied territory here. And if something is gets to us from God, it's a gift, you know. Because no spirit that tries to reside here in this occupied territory is going to be safe. So kind of speaks to the idea that, and it coincides with what Christ said, the devil is the prince of the world. So then the second dream, I'm in that same house I had, I, I talked about being in at the end of the last dream. So this is a, a house from about 10 years ago. And the house has underneath it something that it doesn't actually have, but a tunnel structure that goes down maybe three or four levels into under the basement of the house. And in this tunnel structure, so I've got... I've got a, a whole network in this house. Now, it's, it's me, but there's a number of people who are, you might almost think of it like like a plainclothes military, like a CIA or some kind of like defense force that's plainclothes. But we're in these this, this tunnel network going under the house, right? And what happens is we have another team, like another plainclothes military type team that comes in from the depths. So in other words, from further underground into the house from below. And there's a gunfight that ensues and there's chasing and fighting and we're fleeing. Me and there's a woman who's running with me and we're fleeing around a corner and we, we change, we, we round this corner and someone, one of the two people chasing us throws a grenade, right? So it's supposed to bounce off the wall and come towards us. Instead, it bounces off the wall and goes back towards them. So that's serendipitous, right? Um, the scene changes. I'm upstairs outside in the front yard. It's bright sunlight outside. The doors are wide open to the house. I look back in the house and I know I'm confident that the house has is cleared. So we were victorious. And um, I call up somebody on the phone and just kind of say, it's all done. We took care of it. But then at the end of it, after I hang up on the phone, I'm like, you know, I really should go back and check because I can see shadows inside the house, right? So now just a quick organic interpretation, right? Inside of a household, so again, in your family or in your own spiritual life, in your spiritual community, in your own mind, if you try to go into the depths of secrecy and privacy that are buried under the depths, 
protected from outside knowledge and the community, for example. I'm saying this out loud, but when you keep, you think you have a spiritual interaction in your life, but you kind of keep all that hidden, you're in a lot of danger because there's interactive forces in secrecy that are much more powerful than you. And they'll pursue you and you'll be running and they'll be chasing you and you're not going to do well. The answer is light. So where, where victory came was when I'm standing outside in the front yard and all the doors and windows are open and it's bright daylight. That's victory. Victory is shining light on the, on those forces. There's, there's, a, there's a whole legion of support, but that legion of support is in the light. It's not in that dark quarters under the building. You're going to be struggling and you're not going to be succeeding fighting in the darkness. And that's something that I think comes out just in general. And you can think about this in a million ways in your life, how this applies. But even after I am so confident and I call in and say this is done and I'm confident about it, I look back and I see shadows in the house. So even when you're successful and you feel good and you're doing well, realize that households by their nature have shadowy corners. So your spiritual life, your own mind, right, your own family, your own community has shadowy corners. And when you look back into the house, you realize you can't really be sure that you're not dealing with wrong ideas, bad pursuits, bad goals, bad bad objectives, etc. You can't you can't realize you're not under a deception from dark spirits because there's still shadows in your house and there will always be shadows in your house by the nature of a house. And I guess you could just kind of ponder on what that means. What is the nature of a house, right? But anyway, so I think those are both interesting dreams that are helpful and I think they reinforce the idea that we're in a warfare, a spiritual warfare on this earth and uh, we're in enemy territory and the the prospects for people who don't strive for conversion of life, the service to God and God alone um, are not good. So I'll just leave with that. Let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Have a great week.